Chiaga. I am a student coordinator at the McCarthy Center, and I'm a political science and classic civil major here at St. Ben's. So, on behalf of the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement, I am very excited to welcome you all to this discussion on the book, When Republicans Were Progressive, with the authors, Lori Servant and Senator Dave Dernberg. like to introduce our moderator, the new head of school at St. John's Prep, John McGee. Uh, John is an author himself and is an enthusiastic advocate for students of all ages to be involved in politics in their own communities. I'd like to welcome uh, Star Tribune editorial writer and columnist Lori Sturdivant. Uh, she has devoted her career to public service journalism covering Minnesota politics and has written several books on Minnesota history. And of course, I am happy to welcome U.S. Senator Dave Durenberger. He's the longest serving Republican senator in Minnesota history, serving three terms. And we were honored to have him speak at the 8th annual Eugene McCarthy Lecture in 2014. And he's actually one of the, I think he's the only person to both be the lecturer and also be a resident several years prior to that. And before I let... <laughs> and he has a grandson sitting in the audience. Really? <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. <laughs> before I let John, you know, take it away, I just want to say that there are free books in the back and free McCarthy Center t-shirts uh, for people to enjoy. So yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, um, let me start by saying it's a huge honor to have the opportunity to do this with, with Dave and Lori. I've known Dave and Lori actually quite a long time. Um, for proof positive with Dave, I found somewhere as we cleaned out my parents' house uh, after we moved them a couple of years ago, a picture with myself, a friend of mine, and Dave at the 1984 Minnesota State Fair. Um, <laughs> Dave sporting a pipe and a re-elect Durenberger button, I'm sure. And my friend, a pipe, a pipe uh, and my friend with a Mondale Ferraro pin on his coat. <laughs> and both of us with acres of hair. Um, uh, but it's, it was an extraordinary honor. We were going to do this last winter. Um, and the days we picked, it managed to snow a foot each time. So we decided instead we'd move it during this, to the season of Noah's Ark on a day when we actually didn't have rain. Um, this is an extraordinary book. How many people here have read this book? Oh, yeah, it's an extraordinary wow. book. It's a, wow. it's, a, it's a wonderful portrait of, um, especially the early pieces of it, I think, of Depression era and post-World War II history in Minnesota that I think is really relatively unknown. What we're going to do today is I'm, I'll start with a, sort of a question about what is progressivism. Um, we'll go into a little bit of a history lesson because there's so many fine stories and vignettes in this book. Talk a little bit about where we're headed. This is where Dave was getting worried that this would turn into a graduate's course in political science, which I'd be happy to do. Um, mm. If we have time, we'll do a little bit of a lightning round on some issues, but we will leave about 15 minutes of this hour for all of you to ask questions at the end. So let's start with the obvious first question is, when Republicans were progressive, what's a progressive? And what is progressivism? Oh, thank you very much, John, for doing this. And thank you for asking that question, because it's one we get a lot when we talk about this book. It is the case that in the modern era, we tend to associate progressives with the liberal wing of the Democratic Party. But that word has a rich tradition, and its tradition goes back actually to the Republican Party of the early 20th century. Progressive Republicans then were, were, were a new thing that were the uh, corrective to the laissez-faire Republicans of the Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt was probably their chief exponent. He, uh, his bull moose party's real name was the Progressive Party. He ran for president as a third party candidate in 1912 and he carried six states and Minnesota was one of them. So there was a, a fertile ground here in Minnesota and in the rest of the Midwest too for progressive republicanism. It's associated with Robert La Follette in Wisconsin. It's associated with Albert Beveridge in Indiana. And in Minnesota, it doesn't really catch on with, a, although other than Teddy Roosevelt's success, it doesn't catch on with a lot of Minnesota's leading Republicans until Harold Stassen. 
for me, the progressives, the difference between the, the, the Republicans of the 19th century and these progressive Republicans of the early 20th century is that they are willing to use government mm -hmm. in a proactive way as a tool to address the common people's problems. That's the change that rep they represent. So I'll just add this dimension to what Laurie had to say because that's a very valuable history. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to speak this July at the Commonwealth Club uh, in San Francisco on the book. And um, the reason I was lucky enough to speak there is that the guy who ran the book club for the Commonwealth Club uh, was the son of the progressive mayor of Kenosha, Wisconsin, when George Romney was the progressive president of American Motors before he became the progressive governor of Michigan and all the rest will be history, like his son and some other people. But anyway, um, that was... That was my ro most recent um, opportunity to talk about progressive in a, another context than Minnesota. Progressive in Minnesota from Harold Stass and Arnie Carlson with me and when I came in with Harold Levander in the middle is all about when you spend half of your public life defining the problems of people that you serve or you want to serve are experiencing. And the other half of your life finding enough people like you from one party or the other to find a remedy as a re progressive Republican, starting at the local level and then working your way to the state level and or the federal level, and wherever possible, wherever possible, you find out whether that remedy could not become, at least in part, by a properly motivated and rewarded private sector doing the work for you. That's the Republican experience over 60 years in Minnesota that I learned and, and uh, lived with. So if, if it dates in Minnesota to Harold Stassen, I think mm -hmm. it's a, um, sad that few people here would know who Harold Stassen is. Um, by the time I met him in the mid-1980s, his career was long really over by then, and he'd run for president so many times. He had made himself something he, he, he had lost. Um, the sense of history about him was lost. But since you begin the book with Harold Stassen and your own kind of mm -hmm. political awakening, um, talk, about, uh, talk about him and his influence and why it's important we remember Harold yeah, Stassen. Yeah, I'll just say one thing because it was <coughs> the, the past, past president of the Minnesota Historical Society who really talked me into doing this because nobody has written about Republicans in Minnesota. They write about Democrats, pardon me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but they, they don't write about Republicans, he said. At, I mean, like the history. And, so um, you knew Stassen, and, I you, met knew every, him and you knew everybody else. I mean, talk about me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says to me, "You knew Stassen because you worked in his law firm, you know, and you knew everybody else." So, to be brief in the response, let me say that Harold Stassen was the Pete Buttigieg of his day, um, and I mean that because I said yeah. that on the radio in San Francisco when I was asked who are you going to vote for. I said, "I'm going to vote for the Harold Stassen of in this campaign, Pete Buttigieg." Uh, he's speaking for the future from the youngest of the adult generations. Okay? That's Harold Stassen. He lives in a state in which a majority of the people said, we aren't going to war with Adolf Hitler. He's a decent guy, you know, blah, 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 all kinds of excuses. A majority of Minnesotans. In fact, the Democrat senator switched to the Republican Party in 1940, Henrik Shipstead, on that theory. And Harold Stassen went up against that at age 30, when he ran, with all the cowboys from South St. Paul riding around with him. You know, and he won by the largest majority yet for any Republican running for governor in 1938. And within two years, he was speaking at the National AFL Convention. He was speaking at the US Chamber Convention. He was mentioned if they could change the Constitution appropriately as a vice president or presidential candidate at that age. He said, stood on the, on the Battle, on a battleship in Tokyo Harbor with Admiral Halsey taking the, you know, this is just, he's still in his 30s. He released a whole bunch of people from the veterans, including people from Brainerd from, from the um, Bataan Death March. I mean, here's a guy who, before he's 40 years of age, has lived much more than any of us would ever hope to live. And he takes that experience to a presidential candidate when he probably should have run for the United States Senate in 1946, because if he had, I swear he'd have been the Republican 
gov or president of the United States in 1960. Yeah, no, I see uh, Harold Stassen as really as an important a figure in 20th century Minnesota politics as Hubert Humphrey is in the Democratic Party, the DFL Party. Uh, Harold Stassen really remade the Republican Party in this state with partly through the force of his personality, the power of his ideas. Dave alluded to the fact that he was an internationalist at a time when the, the rest of the party had been an isolationist. He was also very willing to be a, a friend of organized labor at a time when the, the prior Republicans had been hostile to the labor movement. He was professionalizing and improving government and making government a more vigorous responder to needs like the, those that, uh, uh, for uh, in the welfare realm. That all, was all new to the Republican Party, that Republicans that had been in power in the 1920s weren't in that, in that place at all. You have to remember that there, between the 1920s and Harold Stassen's election in 1938, there was eight years of farmer labor party control, a party that was that Floyd to the, B. Olson? that was that was Floyd B. Olson, and that was a party that was responding to the depression with a more vigorous use of government than had been seen in probably any state in this country. Uh, it, it, Harold Stassen represents a, a move of the Republican Party a little bit in that direction, a, a more activist government than the Republican Party had favored before that, in order to respond to the. the needs that had arisen in the Depression and then in the years that followed. How many states would have been similar to Minnesota at that time? So you've got Harold Stassen um, at a particular point in history, Depression era initially, war era, a significant post-war, Cold War era, and you, his influence runs at least through Governor Levander. Um, how many other states could claim a kind of progressive mantle that, that Minnesota did over that time period? Well, I, 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 I'm going to guess at this, I'm afraid, because I can't... Uh, it wasn't in here, so mm -hmm. I'm asking off script. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, <laughs> uh, I, w I would say that um, once you get it out of the south, the border, and the Rocky Mountain West, there were a lot more. You know, most of the states had at least had that inclination, okay. whether or not they talked progressive or they acted but they, they would act progressive. And in the, in the sense that we try to think about it mm -hmm. as anticipating and contributing to the solution of, of, uh, of problems. There's, I don't know, I, it's hard to say that anybody like Minnesota because the distinctive part of this country is the formation of the, United, of the Senate in the, in the Constitution to represent 13 different colonies called states where the people all came from a different part of Europe and came here for different reasons. The Unitarians were one class in one sense. So the Catholics were in Maryland, the Unitarians were up in New England. You know, the, the slave owners were down in the South, you know, this sort of thing. Why did they come? <laughs> they, they settled together in those days. But these states are still, that's still who the states are, who the states represent. And, um, so that's, that's why I divide it, you know, sort of like across the middle of America. And you cited in the book a quote, you quoted Russell Long, uh, when every state is heard from, there is sound policy. Um, it's a great quote. Is it still true? <laughs> the question we would able to ask is every state still being heard from, or uh, have okay. we so Fair. nationalized our politics right. with an uh, 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 unwillingness of, uh, legislators from different parts of the country to stand apart and take a distinctive position. That, that willingness seems to be gone, and, and with that we, we, we are increasingly two warring partisan tribes seeming to be finding very little middle ground. The middle ground used to be found, but with progressive Republicans like Dave Durnberger, and he was in the, the U.S. Senate as recently as 25 years ago. Uh, that middle ground has almost vanished, so, so it appears to us now. In a small but um, powerful story you told in, in the book, you talked about the relationship between Governor Elmer Anderson and Josie Johnson. Um, uh. It was a great story. Josie Johnson was with the Minneapolis Urban League. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, a bill up on housing, a mm -hmm. uh, fair housing bill, mm -hmm. with powerful interests opposed to it. And if it was the politics of today, it dies. Mm -hmm. But instead, um, Governor, uh, Governor Anderson Elmer L. Anderson, mm -hmm. not C. Elmer Anderson, um, mm -hmm. takes that and, and, and helps make it happen. Could you share a little, you know, some more insight about that story? It's, it, well, it's, uh, it's a very small story in the yeah. book, but it's a it's powerful mm -hmm. story. No, it's a very, very important one because, and I'm going to let Laurie tell the story, mm -hmm. um, 
because um, I go to I go to Mass at St. Peter Claver, which is the is the African American Catholic Church in St. Paul. And in the book, I think I say, with a smile, <laughs> I say, um, <coughs> Josie sits on the far left of the church, and I sit <laughs> on the right center, <laughs> just off the, just off the right hand right hand and uh, pews. But I've gotten to know Josie in you know later in life. But what it says about Eleanor Anderson in this relationship uh, is, is monumental. It was Mike, it was Dave and I both had great good fortune to know Elmer Anderson very well. Dave, in those years when he was, uh, uh, not so much being when he was governor, but when he, in, in later years as uh, uh, Dave goes to work for, for Elmer in the early 1970s at H.P. Fuller Company. And then late in Elmer's life, when he had lost his eyesight but was wanting to do an autobiography, he called me to write it with him. So the, the autobiography, that, that was the first book I did. It came out in 2000, and it's called I Trust to, no, that, I Trust Believe the Second One. This one was A Man's Reach. Yeah. We, Elmer and I did two books together, as it turns out, and we had a great time. And I included this story in, the first, in Elmer's book as well because I love this story as well. Uh, Josie Johnson is a young lobbyist for the Urban League from Minneapolis and is working hard on this fair housing bill and sees that she is stuck, and she goes to the Republican governor's office seeking help, which in today's frame of mind, that isn't where you'd think a lobbyist for the Urban League in Minneapolis would go for, for help. But Elmer, when he was in the state Senate, had carried the, the Fair Employment Practices Bill, which passed the legislature in 1955. We were only the second or third state in the country to pass a state-level Fair Employment Practices Guarantee outlawing barring discrimination in employment practices on the basis of race. So she knew, she, he had also, by the way, spoken out uh, to uh, uh, oppose the routing of the freeway, the 94 freeway, mm -hmm. through the Rondo neighborhood, something that is even to this day seen as just a, a travesty that was done to that neighborhood. So he, she knew she had a, a likely friend in Elmer, and uh, Elmer said, I know the Senate, and I, here's what I'll do. I'll write a personal note right now to each of the Republican senators on this Republican-controlled Senate panel saying to them, this is an important issue for the state's future. And even if you can't vote yes affirmatively for this bill now, could you at least vote your consent to get this bill to the floor of yeah. the Senate, where it was being carried, by the way, with, by, by another fellow that, was, that, that we both knew well, Don Fraser, was the sponsor in the Senate. <laughs> and that, Elmer's notes turned the tide. The bill got out of committee. That committee was its toughest hurdle. And El to this day, Josie would say that Elmer Anderson was the one who made that bill become law. Again, Minnesota is one of the first states in the country to outlaw discrimination in housing practices. It's two pages of the book, and yet mm -hmm. it covers the entire arc mm -hmm. uh, of the book. It's a marvelous story, both mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Um, I think as you define progressivism, mm -hmm. and how Minnesota just got stuff done. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward to your decision then. You've, you've, um, you know, you're, you're a central Minnesota guy um, who grows up here mm -hmm. on this campus, 1951 graduate of the prep school, 1955 graduate of St. John's University. He's one of us all the way. Um, the, uh, um, a young attorney, um, successful practice, growing family, active family, and you make the decision to run for uh, the U.S. Senate at a really, really interesting time uh, in, in Minnesota's, I would call it contemporary history. Some of you here would call it contemporary history. <laughs> Others would not. Um, but talk about that decision to run and how it was rooted back in uh, the way you were raised and sort of the progressive values um, that, yeah. that you had taken on. I see there's a Polish uh, artwork exhibit out here someplace, which reminds me to give my mother equal credit <laughs> with my father <laughs> for whatever I became. Um, because my father graduated St. John's in 28, and my mother graduated after two years at St. Ben's, graduated St. Ben's in 1932. They married in 33, had me in 34, when I was all they could afford to have in the middle of, of the Depression. But... Um, my dad's best friend from the day he walked in from the highway to the college as a freshman from LeSueur was Fred Hughes from St. Cloud, Republican lawyer in St. Cloud. Fred Hughes was a regent at the University of Minnesota eventually and always spoken of as a candidate. But Fred Hughes and my dad and mother and people like that in this community shaped my, all my belief systems when it came to you know, was I a Republican or was I a Democrat or a DFL or whatever it is. And if there was any doubt about it, after Gene McCarthy 
you know, uh, had the nerve. And, and Gene McCarthy was a friend in our home all the time because, you know, Gene McCarthy was a totally likable human being, you know, 100%. So I got to know Gene from being a little boy almost as well. But, but all of this, all of this uh, came home to me when Gene McCarthy in 1948 decided to run for Congress in St. Paul against another Johnny, Ed Devitt, who was a Republican. And at that point, forget it, as far as George and Isabel were <laughs> concerned. And somehow or other, you can tell that stuck in, that stuck in my head. That reaffirmed um, why, what, I, what I considered my, quote, politics, re Republican politics. But it also, it also, when I talk about two men as important to American history, potentially, and one at a lo more local level as a, as a judge, and the other one as a as a as a senator, um, it says something about what we raise up around here besides moonshine. <laughs> you know, it it, it 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 does. And so, when we're having all these conflicts, like it ha almost happened in St. Cloud today, I'm told, and things like that, remember that's not who we are. It really isn't who we are. But it it was, and that's how I got it. Though I got to work for Harold. Levander, because Fred Hughes said I was worth hiring. And I, so I'm in Stassen's law firm. And when Stassen, when Levander decides to run for governor, I decide with the other younger guys in the firm, hey, it'd be a great opportunity to get him out of the firm, and we rise to the top. So, <laughs> so we, worked our, we worked our tails off all over the state to get him elected. And um, he asked me to be his executive secretary, which was like his chief of staff. And, in 1967, that was the session that two-thirds of the Republican platform was passed into law. And it wasn't what Michelle Fishbach says is the party platform, abortion, guns, and immigration. No way. No way. It was the first nation's first Department of Human Rights, Labor and Industry, Department of Labor and Industry, Pollution Control Agency, the Met Council, the State College Board. Go through a whole, this was all in the Republican platform, starting with the precinct caucus working its way up. Levander just happened to be the governor that got to pass it. What an education yeah. for a 32 year old lawyer. Mm -hmm. Or then, by the time I left, a 36 year old lawyer. Mm -hmm. wow. So that was it, John. So if it seems um, that there's little we can agree upon today in America, it seems we can agree that the current state of politics and discourse is uncomfortable at best and untenable at worst. Who are the next generation's generation of progressives, independent of party affiliation, and how is that going to happen? John, we've been so encouraged by the younger people, in, especially in local government positions that we've met in the years since our book has been out. Uh, it's been our pleasure to get to know some of the young people who are mayors and city council mm -hmm. members around the state and their commitment to building better communities and to, to uh, dodge partisan slings and arrows as they do if they need to in order to just get the work done, to, to use government as, as a tool in a variety of ways to get some, uh, 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 it, get some economic development back and to keep uh, using all the human capital at their disposal in those communities. It's been an inspiration for us to see that. It's uh, not a surprise to me that the former Republican senator has been expressing support for the DFL or Democratic, I should say, mayor of South Bend, Indiana in this presidential race because you too see in local governments where mm -hmm. local governments are, are successful, we're seeing that uh, there's still some very positive energy and willingness to come together around some common purpose to make life better for people. That's nice to know that that can still happen. It's not happening very much, I must say, sadly, at the state level, which is where I've spent most of my time as a journalist. It's certainly not been happening very much at the federal level. Yeah, and I just affirm that because we both got invited to speak to the League of Cities this year on, mm -hmm. on, on the book. Mm -hmm. and. Um, both of us can start giving you names of mayors and people like that um, whom we've met. And uh, um, the last one I've met was the mayor of, of Minnetonka, who's now going to be the vice chair of, of the League of Cities, and then he will be the chair of the League of Cities. And at the end of our meeting together, he just he held up a picture of, two, of his two oldest daughters. They're age 33, Amy and Jennifer. Amy and Jennifer were born with Down syndrome. Amy and Jennifer are not verbal, nor can they move around. Are they mobile? 
And he's, all he said was, thank you. The Americans with Disabilities Act and my marriage <laughs> and our marriage made it possible for me to be able to do what I'm doing today. Those are the kinds of people we are electing at the local level. We owe it to them. We owe it to them to find out a way to support them through this temporary, I think, period of time of transition until we get back to who is really St. Cloud, who is really Stearns County. There's a, we've seen enough examples, Wilmer and a few other places like that, where it's already occurred on another scale. But those are the people that you want to, to find a way to support in our future all over the country. I don't know about the South. I never know about the South. But, <laughs> but I do think that's our future. You know, all movements happen in context. Mm -hmm. um, they can be because of cataclysmic events. They can be just because uh, the great line from the movie Network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to mm -hmm. take it anymore. Um, is, what's the context here? Um, uh, hopefully it's not a cataclysmic event. But um, it no. is. I, I think we could have actually done more with that question in this book. We talk about mm -hmm. some of the, the things that happened that uh, caused a, a rise of obstructionism in mm -hmm. American politics. We talk about Newt Gingrich's mm -hmm. impact. But we didn't, I don't think Dave, say enough mm -hmm. about what was happening economically right. for people. How the, the rising income inequality, which has been a steady drumbeat, especially since the 1990s in this country, how that left a lot of people feeling left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, there was, has been a geographic sorting that has left many people in greater Minnesota and other parts of rural America feeling left behind, feeling forgotten. Uh, we haven't done enough to adjust for the, cha the globalized economy, how that is making manufacturing jobs very different than what they were. The, the rising educational expectations for our workforce, I don't think we've adjusted to all that very well. I think that's the real context. It's made it easier for demagogues to rise up to say, uh, the, I see you're, you're hurting and the problem is this other group over there, this, the problem is this boogeyman, this, this metro area or whatever it is that they, they want to blame. That demagogues get, get, have, have more credibility when people are feeling the kind of economic distress we've seen in the last 20 years. And we could have said more about all that. Our story, by the way, our arc in this book, runs, it really stops in, in the mid-1990s mm -hmm. when Dave leaves office and, and when uh, Arnie Carlson's re-election happens in the face of the opposition of his own party. Right. Uh, what they, so we, he we, wasn't yeah, endorsed. Yeah, yeah, we, so we make, yeah, we make a flying leap from the mid-90s to an epilogue where we talk about uh, the, the, the status quo today, leaving a, a gap there rather than, than telling a story about a party that was a progressive party that continued to disappear during that time. Here's why it's coming and why, um, why, why we couldn't even get started because it would be a whole other book, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. another well, there chapter. There you go. Yeah. Um, I had a call yesterday from a staff member in the governor's office saying, I, I'm told you're going to meet with the governor next week on such and such, and, and I thought I'd better call ahead to make sure he's prepared. I said, he doesn't need to prepare for me, but if you need, if you need, to, need to know why I want to meet with him, because um, I believe in One Minnesota. I haven't seen it yet. I believe in One Minnesota, and I'm a health policy, recognized health policy expert. I'm quoting other people now. I recognize health policy expert, but one of the things I recognize is change when I see it and the next movement in health care. And it's not about, you know, getting rid of insurance and changing Medicare for all and this sort of thing. It's dealing with the social determinants of health. So one community, one state at a time. And you start with the inequities. Racial and income. But you don't try to solve that one before you go to the others, <laughs> which are all the other things everybody in this room can imagine. How about the performance of our public schools? Hmm? Hmm? Tell me. And we can go on and make a longer list and housing, affordable housing, and, and things like that. But you have to recognize that the failures in the public school system in Minnesota have international attention. Ours is the worst in the country. Start with Native Americans. Go to African Americans. Go to Hispanic Americans. 
Work your way through the list. We ain't doing it, gang. We just ain't doing it. You can't say you welcome immigrants and refugees and people from all over the world and you don't recognize within your economy, not just government this or government that, but your, your economy, your, every existing institution, education, health care, whatever it is, that those inequities have to be overcome. Because this, what's going on in the country today and in the world today is got just too much, too powerful a momentum, um, particularly on the economic side and things like that, not to be stopped somehow or other long enough. And the place to do that is, is at the local level. It is so important to people that were in the healthcare profession that I'm now part of a little group led by former CEO at Fairview, who was that of Premier, which was a big hospital buying organization. The guy now lives in San Diego. He's going to, he's nominated the dealing with this problem on the part of health companies and hospital systems in this country and communities in this country for the Baldridge. The seventh Baldridge category is how well is your community doing and how are they doing it? And your community can be your town or it can be your county or it can be your state, whatever, whatever. But he has the nerve and the belief in this, in this thing that's happening to us right now to, to start a campaign to make this the seventh of the Baldridge categories. Because he's commit, he believes that that's the way to get the private system and the public system to tackle these incredibly large problems. It's a great segue. Let's go to a lightning round, for if we can do that, on just a few issues. Since you spend the last quarter, don't worry, this will be easy. Um, the, uh, the last quarter of the book really talking about uh, or framing issues that uh, even though the book in some ways stops mm -hmm. in time and, and jumps to the epilogue, mm -hmm. um, but they're enduring issues. So let's talk about where you think some of these issues are and where they need to go. And let's start with international relations. The story of your relationship with King Hussein was yeah. another of my favorite small stories in this book. But it seems international relations would be a, a uh, particularly hot topic today since, um, we, uh, since somebody's going to make a call about what's going to happen in, in the Middle East soon. And um, um, so what are we to do about that? Not just that issue, but you describe personal relationships as a foundation. Mm -hmm. um, what are we to do? about uh, international relations today in, 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 if, in an era where progressivism should return? Okay, so I'm, I'm a product of the last half of Jimmy Carter, all of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, who ran against him, you know, but he had, Reagan had the wisdom <laughs> to bring Bush in as his vice president, which means he got Jim Baker mm -hmm. as his chief of staff and then eventually Secretary, Secretary of State. State. I learned from masters. Reagan was not an expert on on foreign, foreign policy. He had stated views on the radio and whatnot else that he was in before. But he had the gift for relying on people that he considered that were smarter than he, or had been somewhere that he hadn't been, <laughs> or that had, that had engaged his trust and the trust of their own constituencies, you know, whether it be in higher education or it be, or it be somewhere else. And so did H. George H.W. Bush. And I, and I brag in this book about the fact that we went for 12 Republican years, six of which had a Republican Senate. And we took down the Berlin Wall. We took down the Soviet Union. You know? And we never started a war you couldn't finish, that we couldn't finish. And it isn't all about wars. We also took responsibility in the Finance Committee for International Trade. I just talked to Jack Danforth today because he called me, the senator from, Louis, uh, from uh, <coughs> St. Louis, from Missouri, who, who called me and said, a couple of us have gotten together and we're going to write a letter to the, we, and watch on this letter, that we're going to write to the, the Senate House, or the Senate uh, Republican leader and the Senate Democratic leader saying, form a bipartisan caucus to get the United States Senate back to where it belongs, basically. Um, so, you know, the, the learning curve <laughs> that I had 
was sure it was blessed with mistakes and blessed with errors and things like that. But in the end, it's, um, you, you can talk about everybody being a great American and things like that till you're, till you're blue in the face. But it's a, it's a matter of making this the work of the people whose responsibility it is. The president, the vice president, the executive branch, the, the Congress, and a whole lot of other people in this country that we respect enough to ask them to be ambassadors or to ask them to run companies. I used to call Cargill whenever I, when I couldn't figure out how to overcome Ronald Reagan's love for Ferdinand Marcos, I called Bill Pierce at Cargill. <laughs> I said, Bill, because Cargill's in every country, they know everybody. I said, what's the truth about what's going over there? Because, because Marcos has had Paul Laxalt conned into believing, you know, that da 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 That's the way we worked in those days. I mean, that, that, and it wasn't because the problems were all smaller. I mean, I was chair of the year, we did Iran-Contra, and we did the about 95% of Iran-Contra before, before it ever went public. And it was to me <laughs> that Ronald Reagan confessed, basically not confessed, but I mean admitted that everything that we, I, we had discovered and talked to him in confidence about was the way it actually happened. You know, did I go blow the horn, you know, the day after? No. Huh? No, not at all. You're the first, probably the first time you've ever heard it. That's, that's, that's an important story, time. Yeah, that, because that, that illustrates that there was and has been through uh, the 20th century a significant role for the Senate, for the members of Congress, in uh, oversight of foreign policy and helping to shape foreign policy. Right now, too much foreign policy, too much of other realms of American policy, too. It's being run as a one-man show. That's not the kind of governance that the founders expected from this country. It's not what worked well in the 20th century. Well, let's switch to another vote then that get, maybe gets to how we change. If I say you, anything, it'll have to be shorter. Voter, that's okay. Voter rights and mobilization, voter mobilization. Um, if you want to make change, people need to be able to vote, and we need to encourage people to vote. Um, you talk about that in the book, about the loss of voting rights. Where does that go? One of the most discouraging changes for me in the Republican Party that I covered over 43 years at the Star Tribune was uh, the, the, the Republican Party that I first knew in the 1970s was strong for voting rights, was strong for high voter turnout in the state, strong for registration policies that, that worked for people. Now to see the Republican Party resisting voter registration and, and uh, cutting back on the, the polls being open, that's quite a dramatic change. It's something that is not in keeping with the, the Republican progressives of the 20th century that came up in Minnesota. Um, we have a number of ideas in the book for how to keep mm -hmm. democracy robust. I'll say that the idea we like the best that we think has the most potency for positive change is ranked choice voting. Oh, Minneapolis, a la mm -hmm. Minneapolis and St. Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, ranked choice voting will give people more choices on the ballot, but allow for at least the strong possibility, if not a certainty, that you'll wind up with a majority backed candidate. Mm -hmm. we, one of the problems we have in our modern system is it allows for a lot of minority rule. Think about the, the small percentage of people that, can, that turn out for some primary <coughs> elections and that decide who, who will be the candidates for office. Think, low voter turnout also contributes in the general election to, to low uh, to uh, minority rule. Uh, we also have a problem in Minnesota in quite a few locales, the cities being one, western Minnesota another, where we really have de facto one party rule. Mm -hmm. That's also not good for democracy. People deserve more choices on their ballots and ranked choice voting would help make that happen. Consider the fact that both political parties in Minnesota now oppose ranked choice voting. <laughs> the big purpose of ranked choice voting is to shake up what used to be a Democratic and a Republican party. Mm -hmm. Take it back to we the people, <laughs> not the, not the so-called special interests. Uh, one more lightning issue at health care, mm -hmm. an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you've spent a good portion of your post-Senate life working on, on health care issues. Um, that too, has been turned into either a you know a binary issue or a meme, mm -hmm. depending on uh, how you want to frame it. Um, what uh, what what must we do as it relates to healthcare? Um, uh, uh, since I'm the so-called recognized expert, yes, um, you are. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, it's to keep it brief. Um, in 1966, when I went to the governor's office, a, a doctor, Paul Elwood, came in to see me and say, Medicare and Medicaid was just enacted. It's really terrific. But they made one huge mistake. 
they used the Blue Cross hospital insurance and the Blue Shield doctor insurance to pay for it, which meant reasonable and customary fees for service. So every doctor, every hospital could charge whatever they wanted. And by June of 19, July of 1969, Richard Nixon, the new president, made a whole speech on the high cost of health care. By January, Fortune magazine had a front page issue on the high cost of health care. So we've been doing reform <laughs> of the system ever since. And um, there was no politics in it, minimum politics in it in the 70s. By the time I got there in 78, and, and uh, basically cha chaired the subcommittee in, in the finance committee and then in the HELP. Um, no politics, no politics. Until the time that Newt Gingrich and Phil Graham and the guys from the House decided to take the Republican Party south. When they did that, when they did that, that made every Democratic president an opponent. The day I voted for the motor voter bill, uh, I was the deciding vote for allowing people, when they register for their automobile, get their car license, to also register to vote. The Republicans tore my picture. Phil Graham tore my picture off the wall in the, in the Senate campaign. And so Graham, Gingrich, those guys, they created all this ethics stuff that went on in that part of the time, nailing 14 of us at one time. All of that was created to, to get, <laughs> you know, a group of Republicans. And, the, and, and so that's how, it, that's how this whole thing got its momentum. And ever since then, it's been politicized to the point where if you had a magic solution, I have a solution. Get rid of insurance, allow us to buy memberships. In, here, you buy a membership in, in Center Care Health. You can buy a five-year membership. Maybe if you're only a student, you buy a four-year membership in Center Care Health. If you're a monk, you buy a lifetime membership in Center mm -hmm. Care Health. And you mm -hmm. probably find out that each year gets a little less costly. Why? Because your motive, which is to stay healthy, and theirs, which is to keep their prices affordable. You know? Otherwise, somebody else, like the guys from the West over there at whatever that's called, Sanford, Sanford. Health, mm -hmm. they might invade it. Or, or the guys who are going to come up from the Twin Cities, like Alina or Fairview. So their goal is to keep those prices down. That's my solution. So I have one <laughs> last question before we open this up. So we've got how many people here are current students? Mm -hmm. So, uh, high school or college, <laughs> um, the, uh, what's your advice to, uh, to these young people who are here today? Um, one of the great things about working at a college or a secondary school is that we're in the futures business. Absolutely. And um, so, what's your advice for the future to them? Oh, I hope that you will consider get being involved in the exciting work that still is to, to be done to build this state and to build this nation. I think that the, the, the pioneer spirit isn't so far away from us in Minnesota. We are still a, a relatively young state, and I think there's still a great deal of potential, especially here in greater Minnesota, may I add, to, to make this into a, a, a place with a very high quality of life. We talked about Elmer Anderson a moment ago, and Elmer would say, and I would sometimes chuckle as he would say it, he, he was sincere. He believed that Minnesota could have the highest quality of life that has ever been created anywhere in this world at any time. He believed so, he believed so fervently in Minnesota, the, the caliber of what was being on offer in this state, and the, the goodwill of the people. He always said if he trusted Minnesotans to do the right thing if they got the facts. And that, getting the facts, that's the, line of, that's the line of work I was trying you know, to be in for all those years. There's a, still a great potential in Minnesota to build a very high quality of life it will take, though, the commitment of a lot of people. And so I hope that, that young people catch that excitement as part of their higher education experience. You know, the, the purpose of education in this country isn't really to prepare people for careers. It's to prepare them for citizenship. And I think that you it, it have a lot of that value at, under discussion here at St. John's. And, and I think that's to your credit. Wonderful. Yeah, my, my advice is... Uh, Continue to respect your parents because they're probably helping you pay the bills. <laughs> but, but you don't have to grow up to be just like your parents. You certainly you don't have to grow up to think just like your parents. You have a wonderful opportunity in an institution like this, in an institute with a history like this place has. And I mean that seriously. And a lot of it is in those guys in the black robes that walk around, you know, and 
been here for a long time and made a different kind of a commitment than, than you've made. But just, just think about this. This is a terrific opportunity to say nothing of your colleagues in, in, that, are, that are your classmates. And you're all now qualified to vote, which means you're smart enough to figure out what's going on in St. Cloud or what's going on in your hometown. Not just what, not the opinions of the right, the left, as expressed in the, in the media, but think about something you can wrap your head around because they're probably in the same class that you're in, probably in the same dorm you're in, you know? This is a heck of an opportunity, heck of an opportunity. And it's all, you're just, it's like this. It goes like this, up all the time. Not that it isn't hard to do sometimes. But, but take advantage of this. Take advantage of this opportunity. And let's thank God for the people that invented the McCarthy Center because there's a built-in set of opportunities, right? Right around uh, the, the center to say nothing of the faculty that comes equipped to do the same thing. The first two words in the rule of Benedict are listen carefully. Um, so, to the young people who are here today, mm -hmm. turns out that's excellent advice. Um, and uh, it's more, actually, in the rule of Benedict, it's more than advice, it's actually a directive. But nonetheless, um, mm -hmm. they, are words, uh, they are words to live by. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions, but thank you so much to Lori and Dave. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Let's hear yours. 10 minutes, 12 minutes for questions. Let's hear yours. I have more if you don't. I have, um, a, it's actually a plug for Lori's book on the Pillsbury's, which I thought was absolutely outstanding. I said every person in Minnesota should read that, to read that legacy. And I said it's not like they didn't make money, but it's what they did with their money that really was so inspirational. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I got that at the Twin City Book there, and that's where I got this book last year. So um, that's another great place. Talk about the, the excitement of the pioneers, how you can get caught up in the building of a state. You know, John Pillsbury could have sent his, uh, his kids back to, east, to the east to study, but he put his sons and daughters at the, the young University of Minnesota because he was building that place, and he was wanting to, to have them experience that, that place as he was building it. Just one example of how, how they were so caught up in, in this project. I think it's still possible for us to get caught up in the project of building Minnesota. Um, so you've talked a lot about how politics has changed and you know, it's, you've really seen a big difference. What do you think about how the press has changed? <clears throat> well, the press has changed a great deal, no question about it, but the, the, a lot of those changes are driven by technology. It, it's, it's the uh, around-the-clock deadline as opposed to the deadline that came twice a day and then you could uh, sit back and, and at, at a little more leisure, do a little more digging. It's the little more digging that, that isn't happening as much as I would like to see. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, the, the, the haste to, to publish. But I, I still feel pretty good about what's happening in newspapers. I think the New York Times and the Washington Post are serving this country very well in this time. And I'm concerned about people's, um, uh, uh, people who are choosing to, to get the, all of their news from cable television, which is basically an entertainment medium, not a, uh, a, a news medium, in my opinion. And that's true of all the, the stations that are purporting to deliver news. They, they do an awful lot by way of entertainment to, uh, to attract a large audience. And they do so by hyping and using outrage, using fear. Those are the kind of, of emotional tools that, that tend to build a big audience. Their goal is to build a big audience to deliver to advertisers. It's not necessarily to build up democracy. The, uh, I mentioned the fact that Roger Ailes was my campaign publicist for three, three, uh, three elections. Roger Ailes ended up founding Fox News and, and dying eventually. That's all. But Roger... <coughs> Roger said, Dave, you can campaign on what you want to campaign on and what you think your strengths are. I'm going to tell you that if you don't campaign on this issue, you aren't going to win, you know. And he was a master at the takedown. <laughs> no. He was, and, and you can see that. So I, I give you that example. How to, you, you tear them down so you can build yourself up. 
every one of you as a parent or somebody that taught you that a long time ago. You don't tear somebody down in order to build yourself up. But that's Roger's theory, and that is what he fostered through cable news and then the spread of cable news, the FCC rolling, ruling that allowed you know, all kinds of radios. To, but beyond that, there are 62 or 63 think tanks in America at the state level that ain't no more a foundation think tank than the man on the moon. It's like the Center for the American Experiment here in the Twin Cities. A great idea taken away from, from its creator, and now it becomes the, you know, and I really the, the, the publicist, if yeah, you will, yeah. for negative, negative thinking. Not, not even positive thoughts about how to change things, but basically negative thinking. And pretty soon negative thinking is all you get from your friends, if not, if you aren't in it. So there's two, this is the environment we live in now, which makes it challenging. You spoke briefly about bipartisan friendships. Are they still there now? Are they just not reported? And what could change if there was more um, working, more discourse between them? Sure, the, the thing that took them down was when Newt Gingrich in 1995, when they took the majority, told his people to stay home, leave their families at home. And I'll, guarantee, I'll have you come to Washington for two nights a week, maybe three weeks out of, the, out of a month, and maybe eight or nine months out of the year. And he held that promise. So you stay home, you work home, you know, you raise money, you do all that sort of thing. When you took the family out of Washington, you changed <laughs> the nature of relationships. And I say that even more as the number of women and mothers, you know, become part of that environment. It's, it's I, other than being somebody who experienced it, there's, there's, I have no other expertise on this subject other than to say it is, a, it is a critical, critical factor in bi bipartisanship. I've been to Washington often enough with students when I was teaching um, to know that our current senators from, from Minnesota, for example, will introduce me to somebody from across the aisle, you know, and they will talk about them in a positive vein because they're doing something together. You know, it isn't all, the, it isn't all negative. You know, they're, they're finding ways to work across the aisle. But at the point where the leader of the Senate can say, you know, we aren't going to touch gun control or immigration or anything until we find out what the president will sign, I mean, that, the Constitution, well, folks that wrote the Constitution would roll over in their whatever graves or something. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the need for congressional reps to go back home to fundraise. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about the role of the campaign finance reform could maybe make in addressing some of the dysfunction that you're talking about. Yeah, well, we do talk about our, our longing for campaign, some kind of campaign finance reform that would minimize the role of, of really you know, big, deep-pocketed people who have, are, are doing a great job of having a great deal of influence in Washington. Given what the Supreme Court has said about their definition of freedom of speech, there's, there's, unless the Supreme Court changes its mind on and reverses, for example, Citizens United, there's not a lot that can be done with the exception around, of the issue around disclosure. The, uh, the Supreme Court allows for uh, requirements for disclosure. And our, our legislature in Minnesota and uh, the, certainly the Congress yep. have been unwilling to it, it require di uh, tough disclosure rules around uh, campaign finance. So that's the opportunity for citizens who would like to see more, more grassroots control, more power to the people in our politics. We're calling for disclosure is, is right. important. There's an organization in Minnesota called Minnesotans for Clean Elections that is working on this issue. By now you probably know I'm a retired Republican. I'm not a Democrat, I'm a retired Republican. But <laughs> if, you can, if you can recall back, you know, as long as Obama was president, the Republicans were holding hearings on the IRS. Every, every Congress, you heard something, they're beating up on the IRS for something. One reason only, the non-exempt, or the, the exempt section of the IRS, where you are declared whether or not you're really a not-for-profit for the following reasons, and where enforcement of the kind that Laurie talked about would have to come from. Mm -hmm. Student in... Uh, one in the back, and then you in the orange shirt. Got it. Well, uh, you talked a lot about how there's diverse uh, issues and everything that are separating parties more and more. Uh, in your opinion, which issue do you think is causing the most division between the two parties right now? 
Which issues? Which is issue is causing the most, the, the biggest division between the two well, parties? Uh, well, for, I'll just say, uh, Laurie probably the, the better one to answer it, but I, I have the impression, and I used it earlier, that when Michelle Fishbach from Painesville, Minnesota, declared her candidacy against a, a Democrat who votes more like a Republican in the 7th Congressional <laughs> District in Minnesota, yeah. you found out what the issues were in Minnesota, you know, their abortion, which means the religious right, you know, across the country, as we call it, like, oh, but it means, you know what it means. And it, there's, I don't want to just characterize that. I'll say abortion, immigration. The House refused to pass an immigration bill a few years ago that came from a from bipartisan bill that came from the Senate to the House. And the House refused to pass it. They refused to even consider it. The Republican House. And then guns. Come on, guns. Yeah, and certainly those, those, those are three big ones. Yeah, those are three big ones. And, you, and you, I, I would say if my perspective is from the Minnesota legislature. Uh, as recently, well, in 1979, my first session at the legislature, one of the issues I followed was should there be a gas tax increase, something that you've heard about before in Minnesota. And the dispute, dispute was between Governor Alqui, by the way, it's his birthday today. He's 96 years old today. <laughs> Governor Alqui wanted a two cent gas tax increase, and George Pillsbury, a senator, a Republican senator with whom I did a book, uh, uh, George wanted a four cent increase. So this was a fight within the Republican Party. How much should we raise the gas tax this year? And boy, is it a different Republican Party today. And anything that has to do with any kind of a tax increase right now is verboten for Republicans as a, a matter of, of, of almost religious principle rather than uh, a, a reason for thinking about how we're going to finance government. With the exception of the tax part, when Peter Hutchinson who was an executive with the Dayton Hudson Foundation. Then he mm -hmm. was the commissioner of finance when I worked there mm -hmm. and uh, later formed his own yes. really interesting group, the Public, Stra Public Strategies Group. When he ran for governor, and, and it was in his literature, but I remember talking to him about it because he got a similar question. He answered it this way. He said it was guns, gays, God, and gynecology mm -hmm. were the four divisive issues mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in, in politics. And he, he just made it in a sort of pithy, odd way. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I remembered it. Easy, well, yeah, and easy to remember when you talk about the, the alliteration yeah, there. Yeah. Um, student. Um, so with the 2020 election cycle already started, what can the fact of Minnesota having the only split state Congress show about uh, how the state will vote in the 2020 election? <laughs> I, th I think you mean the, the split in the legislature. Yeah. Yes, we have, we have the only state in the country that has a, a Republican House and a, a Democratic, uh, uh, I'm saying it wrong, Republican Senate, Democratic House. You know, I, I've been hearing from both parties for, all, for the last year that this is going to be so, such a close election. Minnesota is really in play like it hasn't been. It's really the last time a Republican won Minnesota was Richard Nixon in 1970. And I'm not sure if I, if I buy that or if I think that is uh, the, the hype of two political parties that are trying to raise money right now as fast <laughs> as they possibly can. It is true that we have, uh, I think, more Republican willingness to spend money in this state because the 2016 election was closer than people expected. But the 2016 election was close not so much because more people voted for the Republican candidate Trump. It's because fewer people voted for the Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton and voted instead for third party candidates. It's not clear that there will be as many third party candidates this time or that that temptation will look as good to people depending upon who the Democratic candidate is. It's also the case that Minnesota is, is becoming uh, more diverse racially. That favors a Democratic win. It's also the case that the millennial generation is now completely in its a voting age and is, is actually in its 30s, establishing households, establishing families, and they will be much more likely to vote. And that generation is also less interested in voting for Donald Trump than their elders are in the state. So for those two reasons, I'm not sure the state is as much in play as the two-party hype wants us to believe. I love your question, and I think the answer is it depends on Tim Walz. That's a good answer. We're waiting for him to define himself right now in some fashion that will help people <clears throat> make that decision. I'm glad we finished with two questions from students. Those are the last questions. Thank you so much for being here today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have a commercial. Yeah, I got a quick, couple quick announcements. Uh, the first one, this is just a reminder, students especially, if you guys are interested in this book, we do have um, some free copies available as well as the signed. Book. Signed, yes. Oh. Um, and free McCarthy Center t-shirts. They're new this year, new design. They look awesome. 
And then uh, coming up on Tuesday, September 24th, is our first Politics in a Pint of the Year. Uh, it is scapegoating and stigmatization uh, rhetoric of mental illness and gun violence in today's America. Uh, if you come, there's going to be free pizza and pop, and it's going to be a great discussion. So, yeah. And thank you so much again, Tori. Thank you.